have I made a video on the the prospects of small scale ammonia production um, about six months ago, and I got about a thousand views on YouTube, which is actually quite a lot for such a kind of niche subject. Um, there's quite a lot, a lot of interest, and but you know one thing I do want to say um, in this updated video, which is going to be quite a bit longer, uh, we're going to go into a lot more detail. Um, it, what I want to say is that you know that I actually had received a comment, and this guy said that you know he thought the Heber bot, and this is a very common assumption. And there's you know if you read papers um, from the you know from the industry, especially from uh, you know I, I guess I should start out by saying that you know there, there is a lot of interest in this idea of green ammonia a lot of it to to you know sort of mitigate carbon emissions you know to kind of prevent putative global warming and this is a a separate subject or separate issue that we should probably talk about in a separate video but um what i think is important to to sort of highlight is the fact that if you read papers about, uh, if, if anybody has proposed scaling down money, that you, you often find people claiming that, you know, we need some kind of new electrochemical uh, ammonia synthesis system, or we need some new catalyst, or we need, uh, we need to do it with plasma, or, you know, all these sort of unconventional, uh, novel ways of synthesizing ammonia. And if you read the in introduction, you know, the abstract of the paper, they often start out by saying, you know, the Haber-Bosch process is not suitable for small scale. You know, they'll, they'll often say it's too energy intensive or something like that. And, you know, I, I take issue with a lot of those claims that we're actually wrong. I mean, the, 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 there's just no factual basis for their claims. So a lot of these papers claim is that um, it's, it's, you know, it only, only really makes sense to do the high pressure process a large scale. You know, we've been doing for about 100 years these big forged steel reactors that are hundreds of tons and um, you know we have these big centrifugal compressors driving them um, and you know we benefit from economies of scale and you know this is the the dogma that you're going to hear out there and it, you know, it just turns out it's wrong like a lot of things that we take for granted that's why I'm always skeptical of uh, common assumptions you know unless it's something like gravity where we all agree that that's a real thing but a lot of times you have assumptions that are made um a lot of it has to just do with kind of established um dogma that comes out of industries especially industries that are rel relatively specialized where you know you don't have a lot of exposure to different perspectives or you know different interpretations um and so i think that you know it's important to actually really analyze really dig down into the details and you know to conclude that again these claims are, are wrong and so getting back to that 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 initial comment that i received on on um on youtube um <coughs> what he had said is that you know it's it, the haber -Bosch process is not suitable for um you know f for frequent startup and shutdown and you know there, there is some truth to that uh, i'm not going to completely um, you know, deny the fact that the Haber-Bosch process being a high temperature process would preferably uh, operate in a steady state regime where you mitigate or, mi or minimize um, sudden temperature fluctuations, which would be expected to cause um, a damage to the catalyst morphology by um, taking the catalyst, which, you know, is the only part that you'd be concerned about. Everything else is just a bunch of heat exchangers and big, you know, reactor vessels. It's not like cycling those components up and down would, would be a problem. It's more the, the actual, um, uh, the, the core catalyst basket, right? Where you have this magnetite or rustite catalyst, it's iron oxide. And the idea is that you, you don't want to, you know, take that from room temperature to, 500 degrees every three minutes. I mean, every uh, you know, every few hours. That would be inadvisable. Um, the idea is that you know you have this magnetite or iron oxide, this iron oxide, uh, rustite or magnetite catalyst. And you don't want to take that from you know, 500 degrees down to you know 30 degrees every few hours uh, if you're running on off some solar farm or wind farm. And so this, you know, this idea of distributed production, we have to emphasize. You know, it, you're not going to just be drawing from some steady state source like a hydrocarbon or coal because it doesn't really make any sense to do that the whole idea behind distributed production is if you have a source of power you know if you're an 
you want to produce this stuff yourself. You're not interested in doing it to save the planet or any of these kinds of nebulous ideas. You're interested in it because you want to produce a compound that's valuable, that's useful. You need to use that compound for whatever application you have, and you don't want to buy it from the market because you can. You find that there's there's reason to believe you can produce a compound a for cheaper, uh, more reliably, uh, and you can hedge against future uncertainty. So it really does make a lot of sense. The issue is providing the technology. Uh, for people to actually do it, and you know, you, you know, you would expect that because this technology is so mature, so old, that it, you know, it would have been done before. People would have designed a small-scale plant and put that, in, you know, in a, in a in a container, perhaps maybe put it underground, um, and you'd be able to buy these things, you know, for maybe a uh, hundred thousand dollars, and you'd be able to uh, because if you actually look at the the the, the components by weight. You know the cost of of um, of a product if it's produced efficiently, especially if it's produced at a large um, production volume. You know should kind of converge to around you know let's say ten dollars a kilogram of, of of system weight. So if you have a if you see if you have a one ton of, of of metal, you know if you conclude the fabrication all that, your your stainless steel is say four dollars a kilogram, and so the final product's about ten dollars a kilogram, right? So. Um, you know that that's a realistic price if, if it's being produced efficiently. Efficiently, you know something is is very niche. It's very specialized. It's very high end. The price per pound or kilogram is going to be far higher than the baseline. You know material contribution. Um, so going back to um, right. So when we talk about integrating with renewables, um, and we agree that if we take the Haber Bosch process. And we cycle it on and off too much. We're obviously going to have to deal with the fact that our catalyst could incur damage to its crystal structure. Uh, it could incur, you know, negative evolution in the crystal structure towards lower activity, and that would either necessitate the frequent replacement or refurbishment of the catalyst, or it, it might necessitate, um, or it would require you to uh, effectively sacrifice activity, uh, and that's obviously undesirable. So. What the plant designer would do is uh, take advantage of the fact that since the reactor for a relatively small scale plant, you know, a few hundred tons per year, uh, which is all we're trying to do, uh, that this, this flow rate um, is effectively is so low that the reactor size, the size of the reactor, would be so insignificant that we could actually have an electric heater placed inside the reactor. Provided we insulate the reactor using um, microporous insulation, which is a insulation technology made out of silica and alumina fibers, where the uh, the the space between the fibers is is smaller than the mean free path of, of air molecules, so it halts convection. And this insulation technology has a thermal conductivity of about 0.03 watts per meter kelvin, and so with that type of thermal conductivity, you could have a reactor that's about uh, about a, t a 300 kilogram reactor, which would house about 13 liters of catalyst, and that would be able to produce about 50 kilograms of ammonia at higher pressures, so get higher catalyst activity, obviously at higher pressures. Um, and this this reactor would be able to produce about 400 tons of ammonia a year. And the heat flux of the reactor, if you had 10 centimeters of insulation, would amount to about 130 watts, which isn't very much. You know that that's tolerable. Um, and so you could basically keep the reactor warm when you shut off your power plant, your coal, uh, or excuse me, your your wind, or your uh, uh, photovoltaic power plant is no, when it's no longer producing energy. What you would simply do is uh, shut the flow of gas uh, to the reactor, and you would keep that gas in there at you know the the, the two to one um, ni nitrogen uh, uh, hydrogen nitrogen ratio. You don't you don't want a three to one ratio because uh, the stoichiometric ratio has uh, the highest activity for the reactions when there's actually more nitrogen than the stoichiometric ratio. Um, so you, you cut that, that gas supply off, you keep that gas in the reactor uh, at its rated pressure, and at that point what's going to, um, what you're going to do is then turn on your electric heater, which is going to be basically a coil heater where you have a uh, obviously a you know, one of these nickel uh, titanium alloys that has very high resistivity, and you would flow a DC current through that. And uh, obviously, you know, at low uh, 
a very, a very high amperage, and it would produce the heat necessary to keep the reactor at about um, you know, 450 degrees. And you could either do two things. You could either keep that reactor warm the entire time your power plant is down, or you could simply slow down the rate of, of, thermal, uh, uh, of thermal transition, right, from, from very hot 450 to 500 degree operating temperature to 20 degree ambient temperature. Um, if you were to really smooth that transition, you could probably just get away with, with doing that because it would provide a satisfactory catalyst life because it would attenuate the stress placed on the catalyst crystal structure from, from thermal expansion. Um, or you could actually just um, uh, keep that, that reactor warm the whole time because it's so little energy, right, 130 watts. It's nothing. That's the amount of power you're... Um, I mean, for reference, you know, a, your typical computer uses about 100 watts or less. You know, hair dryer is 1,500 watts. Uh, nothing close to that. Um, so the amount of heat you'd actually need to, uh, to put into the reactor to keep it, uh, you know, to keep it warm isn't, isn't very much. Right, so there's really two arguments um, that, that favor, uh, you know, economies of scale, right? The first one is purchase volume, right? So if you if you, you buy a lot of, of a part or a lot of a material, you're going to get a better price, or else equal. Now, the second argument, and the thing is, so we can actually do that because what we're doing is uh, claiming that we can produce these in a factory, we can produce a lot of these a year, produce thousands of them a year, and, and, and because we can produce so many, um, we're actually going to benefit from economies of scale as well, just in a different way. Instead, what we're actually arguing is that, in this case, scale works against us. Scale actually raises the cost of the component. Um, it, you know, if you if t t think about a, uh, you know, an ammonia converter, right? So, even though it is true that you have the, um, you know, the, the, the square cube law that if you double the diameter of a cylinder, you're going to uh, increase the volume uh, by four. Now that is true, but it's actually not by mass, it's by surface area. Um, so the way it works is that if you double the diameter of a cylinder, you think, okay, well, my surface area is going up. Shouldn't, shouldn't the weight of the cylinder per, um, uh, you know, per cubic meter of, of cylinder actually go up? Or I should say go down, right? If I increase the size of the cylinder? That's not true. Um, it's not, the weight does not go up because the weight is cubed just as the volume. It's the surface is squared. Okay, and it's the, uh, the, the, the volume that's cubed as well as the weight. So you're not saving reactor weight. If I have a pressure vessel that's three meters in diameter, which is a typical uh, size of a commercial ammonia converter, um, that reactor vessel is going to have the same volume to mass ratio, which determine, determines my cost largely uh, of, the, of the reactor vessel, since it's material times, times fabrication time that, that determines the, the cost. If I actually increase the diameter of that reactor vessel, the only thing I'm doing is decreasing its surface area. And, you know, decreasing the surface area has its advantages. It decreases the heat flux. But, you know, heat flux is not a really big deal. You can simply wrap your vessel with insulation. It's not a huge deal. I mean, 10 centimeters of insulation would effectively cancel your heat flux. So, you know, it's, it's not really a credible argument to make that, oh, well, we have to make ammonia plants really big because we want to preserve as much of the exothermicity of the reaction to power our uh, you know, our, 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 our steam engines for covering, covering the, the compression energy, which is true. And that's, that's an argument that the large scale uh, has in its favor, is that it can effectively use all of that steam that's produced from the, from the reaction. Because, you know, people mistakenly say, oh, well, money production is energy intensive. Well, it's not true. Hydrogen production is. And, and nitrogen production is just to, to, a, to a very small extent. So, you know, steam methane reforming is, is an energy intensive process. It's about 32% the lower heating value of the hydrogen. And obviously electrolysis is an energy intensive process. You're putting more energy in than you're getting out. But in the case of ammonia synthesis, it's actually uh, an energy producing process. In other words, it's actually going to yield uh, net energy that you can use to cover uh, the compression. And, that, and that's, a, that's a fact. If you look at the current large scale plants, they can extract heat from, from the reactions, about, you know, you're, you're going to get about 0.7 kilowatt hours of heat um, per kilogram of ammonia formed. And so for a ton, you got almost a megawatt. And 
that would give you, and actually you need about 400 kilowatt hours to compress um, one ton of ammonia worth of syngas. So the, the two to one hydrogen, nitrogen, syngas, which obviously in the end, it, you know, you, you're gonna get the stoichiometric product, but you run the gas, uh, the syngas nitrogen rich. And, uh, and, and they do that to, to a large extent to um, make it easier to compress, right? Because you, they're using centrifugal compressors. Centrifugal compressors work by imparting kinetic energy into a gas rather than um, squeezing it in a, in a fixed volume chamber. So you do need a certain density to actually compress a gas with a centrifugal compressor. And it actually turns out that even though centrifugal compressors have the advantage of being very long lasting, they, they're oil free, they incur very little friction because you basically just have bearings as far as moving parts. Uh, you know, it's not like a reciprocating compressor where you have to replace piston rings, you have to replace bushings, you have to replace, you know, your, you got connecting rods, valves, you have a lot of c complicated components. Uh, there is an enormous advantage of actually using centrifugal compressors. The main reason they, they switched to centrifugal compressors was because, um, well, the technology became mature, but it, it was also because of the fact that it was, it, they, they first went from reciprocating to centrifugal in 1956. Kellogg was the first uh, company to use reciprocating compressors on their, on their centrifugal compressors on their plants, on ammonia plants. This was in, uh, actually it was in 1963. And so the first half century of ammonia synthesis took place with reciprocating machines. So all the first ammonia plants, the ones that they built in Germany in Oppau, for example, that plant was obviously using a bunch of uh, of piston reciprocating compressors they were oil lubricated and they use coalescers to filter out the the lube oil which obviously otherwise would, would contaminate or foul the catalyst um, so if you built a, if you're a designer of a small scale plant you can simply take off the market off the shelf a standard 150 bar 200 bar 300 bar um, reciprocating compressors and, and these things are a dime a dozen they're used for uh, you know natural gas CNG they have them for uh, compressing all sorts of, of specialty gases. Um, you know, they're widely produced, relatively cheap, uh, and they're pretty long lasting because you're gonna use obviously an oil lubricating machine. Now you can use oil free if you want to and you just use these special, um, uh, they use these Teflon seals or Teflon piston rings. And the thing is they don't last as long uh, and the fact that you can simply use coalescers to filter out the lube oil. There's really not that much incentive to use these fancy compressors like diaphragm compressors that are um, obviously, they separate the actual um, gas section from the hydraulic section. So the pistons submerge in oil, but uh, the gas is, is being compressed underneath this, this thin metal diaphragm. The problem with these compressors is that the diaphragm gets really hot. The diaphragms are really thin. They're prone to abrasion if you have particles in your gas stream. And the fatigue stress of the diaphragm bending up and down hundreds of cycles a minute uh, causes them to fail prematurely. And you can, you can only really run these things for about 5,000 hours. Now, they're chosen for these niche gas uh, compression applications where you might be compressing a very corrosive gas or you, you, you're, you're compressing a gas that has to be so pure that you don't want to even use oil lubricated compressors or even, uh, even with coalescers installed. So because coalescers can, can filter out oil containing you know, 2,500 ppm oil mist, and it can bring it down to 0 .01, 0 0.01 parts per million by weight. Now they can't remove oil vapor. That you need, uh, they usually just use charcoal to remove oil vapor. So you know, if, you, if you're actually looking at the compressor options, uh, ammonia synthesis is by no means uh, uh, you know, a, a big challenge because the gas has to be pure, but not doesn't have to be nearly as pure as say, you know, imagine you're using hydrogen for uh, you know, photolithography. They use hydrogen for, 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 for making CPUs. That hydrogen has to be part per trillion level purity. Um, and so you, you might want to use a diaphragm compressor for that. But for, for ammonia synthesis, there's really no need to use any of these fancy compressors. You can just use regular uh, piston compressors and simply use coalescers to, to filter out the oil mist. And obviously, since we're, uh, we're desiring to connect to a photo, uh, photovoltaic or wind uh, power source, we need, to have a, we, we, we need to have a plant that can operate a part, part load. So it has to be able to, the compressor has to be able to operate at partial uh, load capacity. So um, reciprocating compressors are obviously very desirable in that regard. And of course, the centrifugal compressor, because the pressure ratio is 
dependent on the speed. If you drop your RPM even slightly below its, its rated speed, your pressure ratio collapses, and so you're, you're unable to, to use a centrifugal compressor for any kind of plant that is going to be operating at part load um, if you're drawing from, from an intermittent power source. And, and of course we are. We're going to be using electrolyzers um, connected to ideally wind turbines using a specific type of technology that I've also developed related to wind turbine support structures that enable you to uh, reach higher altitudes. You can uh, find the video in the link about that type of uh, wind turbine technology. But otherwise you could use photovoltaic. Photovoltaic is actually a lot less attractive because the, um, the capacity factor of a typical solar plant is about 20% but the capacity factor of a wind turbine operating at reasonably high wind speeds, especially at higher altitudes, uh, is, is about 50, if not 60% in, in good locations. So it's basically impossible to get a capacity factor over about 25% for solar, but it is definitely possible to get a capacity factor as high as 60% for wind, and, and that's very attractive for us because we don't have to oversize our equipment as much. You know, you have to understand that all of the equipment, right, the inverter for the electrolyzer, the electrolyzer bank, um, the ammonia synthesis um, reactor, the compressor, the pressure swing absorption plant for producing nitrogen or cryogenic insulation, whatever you might use, all of those systems have to be oversized by a factor of four if your solar capacity factor is, is 20%, right, because your peak solar output is going to be four times more than your average output. And so, um, you know, the, in other words, you, know, you, you, you say you have a solar plant for 100 kilowatts, you know, you're, not, you're not just going to divide that output by 8,700 hours in, in, in a year. You're actually going to be um, getting most of that power in about eight hours of the day, and your peak power is going to be at about one o'clock. So we don't have to go into the detail of solar. Everybody knows that the capacity factor is low. It's an intermittent power source, but wind is actually a lot less so because provided you're in a good location, which obviously, you know, the idea of distributed production, not, you're not going to be able to produce ammonia everywhere. Obviously, there, there are going to be um, places where you're simply not going to have power available, right? I mean, you might be privileged to have hydropower available. Um, you might have a dam. You might have uh, geothermal. But you might not have good solar resources. You might not have good wind resources. In that case, you're not going to build an ammonia plant, right? It's, you're going to need some, need some power source. If you don't want to use coal, because coal is really a pain in the ass. It's so dirty. There's all this sulfur. Uh, there's all this carbon monoxide that has to be filtered out. It makes the plant a lot bulkier. You have to f uh, change out filtration cartridges all the time. You have to use a lot more elaborate equipment to filter all that, all those impurities out that using um, coal or natural gas is really a pain in the ass because when you can simply take water uh, and produce all the hydrogen at, at ultra high purities you need, um, it's just a lot more attractive, even though it's theoretically cheaper to produce hydrogen from coal. Um, and you actually look at the, you know, you have to gasify the coal, and, and for natural gas for that matter. In fact, it's easier to produce hydrogen from natural gas than from, or from coal than from natural gas, because natural gas, you need a steam methane reformer. And these things operate at 1,000 degrees Celsius. They have to, um, they, they, they're, their catalysts are sensitive to poisoning, because obviously if you take hydrocarbon and you heat it up, you get coke, you get carbon. So you know, the catalysts don't last that long. Uh, they're, they're quite expensive, the SMR plants. And you now you could downscale them. There's no reason why you couldn't because it's, it's an endothermic reaction. So you're actually putting heat into the system. So you'd want smaller uh, catalyst channels if you could. If you could make them in a microchannel configuration or a kind of process intensified configuration, you would benefit, unlike ammonia, which is an, an, an exothermic process, mildly exothermic process, there's really no benefit from, from downscaling it. Um, although <laughs> we've gone into reasons why it might be possible to incur benefits from downscaling. Uh, you know, overall, uh, SMR systems are, are just really not that attractive uh, for small-scale use. They, they could be made small-scale. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. But from, from our perspective, uh, you know, you're much better off just taking electrolyzers. I'll, I'll put up another video on, on why electrolyzers are ridiculously expensive compared to the material costs. Uh, you could just look at the cost of the nickel electrode. You have to, you have to make the nickel electrode with, with plasma sputtering um, to get the, the rainy nickel surface and get this really fine, you know, really jagged edges for the active catalyst sites. And then you have to use this polyether sulfone uh, membrane to separate the hydrogen from the oxygen so you don't it doesn't mix and blow up. But, you know, electrolyzers are actually really simple devices. You can make these things yourself and 
you can simply um, assemble them into small stacks and because we're, we're running off full of take and wind we actually want to modulate our production we don't want to um, vary the current going into one electrolyzer we, we basically want to have a bunch of stacks and we just flip our current on and off those stacks as power goes up and down during the day um, so we don't have to vary the current in one, in one stack um, and so making the electrolyzer smaller uh, into lots of little stacks is, is they're easier to manufacture that way and it's easier to produce the components but you know electrolyzers are, are just so simple it, it's, it's ridiculous that they sell for a thousand dollars per kilowatt because if you add up the current density that, that you run them at it even if you run them at really low current density which is advantageous from an efficiency standpoint because when you go when your current density goes below 200 milliamps per square centimeter the at say 1.8 volts um, the efficiency goes up to 91 percent of higher heating value right and if you think about you know that that kind of efficiency I mean that's stellar now on the other hand if you um, if you run that current density at 500 milliamps per square centimeter which is pretty much the maximum that alkaline electrolysis can can do the efficiency drops to barely 70 percent and so you're going to be using you know 60 kilowatt hours um, per, per kilogram of hydrogen so that's why when you see the quoted figures of alkaline like electrolyzers and they don't seem very impressive they're uh, they seem very crappy for that matter you know they, they quote figures of you know 65 kilowatt hours needed to crack a kilogram of, of hydrogen um, that's because they're running them at high current density right because they're, they're trying to use less material and, and that doesn't make sense right obviously if you're running at a higher current density you, you 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 use less material but it turns out that simply add up right the the current density you say okay well have the current density is averaged over the two electrodes right so when we say square centimeter of electrode we're talking about there's no such thing as a, a, a one electrode right there's always two electrodes so you're talking about the the, the sum of the surface area uh, of the two positive the positive and negative elect electrodes and so you, your electrode is say you know 0.2 millimeters thick and it's made out of out of nickel out of pure nickel and remember the uh, the anode has to be out of nickel the, the cathode does not have to be the, the, the side that produces um, oxygen is being reduced right so it doesn't corrode only the black uh, the, the, the the side that turns black right nickel oxide um, is the uh, is the the negative side that's the hydrogen evolving side that's the side that corrodes um, your 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 cathode does not corrode you can make that out of steel you can make that out of any material it doesn't really matter so you have one side of the electrode that's made out of nickel nickel you know has made the headlines recently because of the situation with with ukraine russia is about the third largest producer of nickel um, but you know nickel's always actually been a pretty cheap material i mean if you actually look at the average price of nickel from 1992 till till 2020 uh, the average price is about um fourteen thousand dollars a ton and the price just before the ukraine shenanigans was about uh, twenty thousand dollars a ton so it's about twenty dollars a kilogram um now it recently went up to about it's now about 30 um but you know that just doesn't make a huge difference in the capex of the electrolyzer because if you, if you just simply add up the weight of your 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 negative electrode right the hydrogen evolving electrode and even if you wanted to make it out of a millimeter thick worth of of nickel i mean the cost per kilowatt of the nickel itself would at best be like twenty dollars okay at best uh more likely somewhere like ten ten dollars a kilowatt at the current market prices i mean there's no way that you can justify selling an electrolyzer for for thousands of uh, or you know the current prices for these for these european companies like proton or or nell or or, or uh itm power these companies they they, they, they charge like a thousand dollars a kilowatt it, it's just not supported by the chemistry of the of the technology of the material science by the physics those prices are outrageous compared to the to the actual uh, material composition um, and in fact you don't even need to use pure nickel um, uh, 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 anodes you can you can use stainless steel anodes you can use anodes that are made out of maybe at best 20 30 percent nickel in fact pure nickel isn't even optimal from a corrosion standpoint the optimal uh, combination of alloys is like 20 percent nickel the balance you know maybe 15 percent chromium and the balance iron um, you know something like an inconel in fact, if you look at the literature, and I have a whole page on corrosion rates for alkaline electrolyzers, the, the ideal alloy isn't even pure nickel, okay? So that cost I, I, I stated of like $20 per kilowatt, I mean, you can easily make those things, just the electrode, I mean, $10 a, a, a kilowatt, and then the, the separator membrane. See, if you, the problem with these companies, right, that make this equipment is they, they buy all their, all their uh, subcomponents, right, from these, you know, from these high, uh, you know, these are very specialized companies, 
they um, they put a lot of manufacturing process is very specialized. Their their supplier network is pretty small. Um, you know, they're in the, in the case of the separated membrane, we mentioned that for the electrolyzer, and I'm kind of going on a tangent here because I just want to bring up the electrolyzers. I want to very quickly talk about it because it's important to, because, you know, we're, we're, we're claiming that it's it's superior to use electrolysis and steam methane reform or even coal production. Um, I have to you know, substantiate that claim. And so, you know, going back to electrolysis, when, you, when you're choosing material for the, for, the, for, the, for the diaphragm separator, so that's to keep the hydrogen and, and, and oxygen from mixing, um, you can use these uh, these plastic materials uh, called uh, uh, polyether sulfone, and polyether sulfone is about twenty dollars a kilogram. Um, so again, that's that's cheap. So you know what what gives? Why, why are these things so expensive when the materials are cheap? And that's because you know they're making these things in a factory. They might make you know a few of these things a month. Production volumes are minimal. They have a lot of overhead. The wages for the for the assemblers are really high. They probably assemble them really slowly. They probably don't use um, you know, they don't ma- they don't manufacture them in a way that you can actually assemble them really quickly. If you made them smaller, you could just basically um, use like a five axis ro- five axis robot and just uh, uh, place the um, you know the, the, the sheets right because you can, you can use a laser cutter and you're going to cut your nickel and you cut your 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 gaskets and just basically um, stack them and then squeeze the two end plates and bolt the end plates. That's all it is, right? It's so simple. Uh, you know, it's not like making a lithium ion battery where you need these special machines to actually roll the electrode and if you've ever seen the battery manufacturing process you have these thin sheets and then they kind of roll it up like a like a tissue roll so you know no one's claiming you can make lithium-ion batteries for for you know substantially cheaper than they currently are made of uh for about you know 100 per kilo which is a stellar price if you think about it it's a much higher tech technology than alkaline electrolysis the the idea that alkaline electrolyzers sell for more than, than you know lithium batteries is absurd and that's beca- and then because you know you're using lithium you're using cobalt you're using spherical graphite which is very difficult to manufacture you know with an alkaline electrolyzer you're taking a stainless steel sheet spraying some some rainy nickel on it to get that surface morphology for high activity and then you're taking a sheet of polyether sulfone cutting that with a laser cutter and just stacking the whole thing together and bolting it down with these big steel end plates that's all it is it's a ridiculously simple technology and the fact that it's so expensive illustrates that Again, it's, it's really all about production volumes. It's all about how much material do you use that's off the shelf versus how much is specialized, how much is it's procured from these really niche and kind of exotic manufacturers like Afka. And Afka is the company in, in Belgium that makes the, the separated membrane. They use polyether sulfone and then they coat that with zirconium oxide. It's called Zerfon. And now it's a, it's a great material for the job, but it's not necessary. You can get away with running your electrolyzer at lower temperature. And simply using regular polyether sulfone, which which can actually operate at temperatures up to 130 degrees. And you're never going to get, you don't need to operate your electrolyzer that high anyway, because if you do, well, obviously you're going to, your electrode is going to corrode faster. Um, There's just more stress on the system. You can operate it at 100 degrees, it's fine. And so there's really no need to buy that specialized zirfon membrane. And so if you get rid of that, and you just make the electrodes yourself. If you buy your own plasma sputtering machine, by the way, you can buy these plasma sputtering machines for $2,000. In fact, I'm getting one on Alibaba right now, and I'm actually going to make my own electrodes. So it's entirely possible to do this. And the reason I, I'm illustrating this is because, you know, we, we obviously have to show that we can make these, uh, these small ammonia plants and then obviously also procure the electrolyzer supply and we don't want to buy those electrolyzers from these companies it's ridiculous we can make them ourselves design them in a way that we can make use of off-the-shelf components because we're not making this out of super exotic nanomaterials (laughs) we're not making this out of graphene we're making this out of stainless steel sheets um, sheets of, of plastic basically and you know and rubber gaskets and so it's all about being able to manufacture it efficiently uh and so uh, that's something that, that we have to be able to shoot for because otherwise these small ammonia plants, they're great. We can make these for for affordable prices and actually outcompete the existing ammonia production industry based on this centralized production paradigm. But if we don't have the ability to produce electrolyzers for an affordable price to integrate with those small ammonia plants to then plug into our wind and solar facility, then it defeats the whole purpose. And we're basically doing this for nothing. So we have to have um, a very effective... Uh, 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 electrolyzer manufacturing process. We're going to use 
automation to reduce our labor uh, costs because if you just use um, a five axis robot, you can easily have the robot just drop uh, the electrodes onto the stack and just pile it up. And then you probably want to want a human to take the end plates and then bolt them down. Anyway, uh, I digress because I think that's about as far as we need to discuss about uh, regarding electrolyzer, uh, electrolyzer technology. Back to ammonia. Um, so yeah, we, clearly we've, we've illustrated that the challenge is not so much downscaling. You, you, there's really no big deal. Uh, there's nothing intrinsic about downscaling that's, that's detrimental to the process. In other words, downscaling doesn't intrinsically reduce the efficiency. It doesn't intrinsically make the process less effective. It doesn't reduce the activity of the catalyst. It doesn't reduce the activity of the catalyst. The catalyst doesn't care whether it's in a reactor that's 30 cubic meters large or 13 liters in volume. It, it makes no difference. Now, the catalyst sphere size does matter. A smaller catalyst um, will experience a large, a smaller pressure drop. A, a catalyst that permits less intraparticle diffusion, that is, the diffusion of gas into the particle, um, is going to reduce the pressure drop across the circuit. So you need to use expend less energy in compression because in a lot of ammonia plants, especially those that operate at higher space velocities, you're going to incur uh, pressure drop and then you have to compensate for that with, with more compression energy. One of the reasons that a lot of the ammonia converters that you see out there um, in, in, the, in the classic plants, they don't have stellar uh, catalyst productivity in terms of like kilograms of ammonia per kilogram catalyst is because of the fact that they operate at relatively low space velocities and increasingly newer plants only operate at about 150 bar. As a consequence, um, their space velocities and subsequent power output activity is, is pretty poor. Now, for the small scale plant, what we're proposing to do is get close to the pressures that they used to operate ammonia plants in, in the, in the 60s and the 50s. In the early plants, they all operated above 300 bar. Um, in fact, they typically operate at about 350 bar. Now, now that they're having to use centrifugal compressors, they can't. Those types of compressors cannot compress above 150 bar. So you have to use um, reciprocating compressors if you want to get above that. And so any plant, by definition, that uses entirely uh, centrifugal compressors will not be able to operate above 150 bar. Which means you're going to have an oversized reactor that you actually need to because now higher pressures will reduce the longevity of the catalyst because the catalyst only has so much structural uh, integrity. Uh, higher pressures will prematurely wear out the catalyst, but um, you know, it turns out the catalysts are so cheap that it doesn't really matter if you have to replace your catalyst every five years versus 10 years. It just doesn't add up to, to a significant portion of the operating cost. So in our case, the, the number one determinant of production cost is going to be the efficiency of the electrolyzer. So if we can operate our electrolyzer at lower current density, and, and then we can add, um, we can reduce, on the other hand, we can reduce the compression energy for the for the loop, um, then then we can get our, our, our production efficiency of about 8,000 kilowatt hours per ton of ammonia. And again, 90% of that energy is, 95% actually, is, is found in producing the hydrogen, not in, in, in the ammonia process. So when people say it's energy intensive, you need to be clear of what you're talking about because that term is often bandied around and people are not being specific about what they mean but yeah it's, it's just important to um to lay out all these details because there's a lot of fog out there there's, there's a lack of clarity uh, regarding the, the true nature of this technology and this process um, you know, it's kind of cryptic because people see it as so intrinsically high tech and out of reach. You know, it, it, that's really, I think, the best way to put it. They see it, as out, they see it the technology is out of reach. It's not amenable. It's not receptive. It's not conducive to, to miniaturization. It's not conducive to, you know, making these things sort of at home, you know, in your own laboratory. Now, I'm not claiming you can build one of these yourself. You're obviously going to need manufacturing capacity. You're going to need the ability to bore, you know, a, a, a cylinder, a pressure vessel. You need a lathe. You need a CNC machine. You need... Uh, machine tools. You have to manufacture a compressor. You have to manufacture valves. You have to manufacture fittings. But it turns out this is precisely where this technology so shines, or sh I should say this concept, because the reason it shines, um, the reason it's so attractive is because we can actually use off-the-shelf components. Because our flow rates are relatively small, we can easily get fittings and valves and flow meters to make this plant 
um, you know, relatively small components, we can buy those from these online suppliers and get them shipped to our to our facility uh, and use them. Uh, and, and actually, we want to design our plant around the components, the availability of the components, not the other way around. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that we completely handicap ourselves. We obviously are going to have some degree of custom manufacturing. For example, the, the main reactor vessel is going to have to be custom manufactured. There's not, there's not a part that you can buy off the shelf for the reactor vessel. But because the reactor vessel only has to be about 300 millimeters in diameter, it turns out there's, there's millions of machine shops in the world okay, that can produce that that type of reactor vessel, right? I mean, it's like, imagine the global production capacity of hydraulic cylinders for heavy equipment, right? Imagine the number of hydraulic cylinders that are manufactured each year for replacement cylinders, for new cylinders going on excavators, backhoes, and front end loaders, hydraulic equipment, right? This global manufacturing capacity for hydraulic cylinders is immense. And guess what? The hydraulic cylinder itself you know, it's designed to operate at you know, 400 bar, up to up to 400 bar, right? You know, very high pressures, and it uses um, high strength steel alloys, very hard steels. And it turns out we're going to use basically the same material to make our pressure vessel. The only difference being that we need to select materials that are resistant to nitriding because you have high temperature nitrogen. We have to we have to choose a material that's resistant to high temperature hydrogen attack because the high temperature hydrogen, the hot hydrogen, tends to decarburize the metal. So you don't obviously want to use any alloys with a lot of carbon. Um, and, and thirdly, you obviously want a material that can uh, maintain relatively high tensile strength at you know, 400 degrees. Now, that's all done already. We have alloys that use vanadium, chromium, and molybdenum that can achieve uh, uh, good resistance to nitriding and high temperature hydrogen attack. So, um, but the key is being able to build the reactor um, using the global production capacity of um, you know, smaller scale lathes and, and forging equipment that that can, that can produce a reactor that looks quite similar to a hydraulic cylinder. And on the other hand, if you limit yourself to the number of, of, of manufacturers globally that say specialize in forging pressure vessels for nuclear reactors, these are huge pressure vessels. Um, they're, 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 they're forged with gargantuan forges and, and, and stamping machines. <clears throat> you know, on, on the other hand, if you limit yourself to choosing from the from the list of suppliers globally that make say large pressure vessels for nuclear reactors you know these are gargantuan pressure vessels let's say you limit yourself to manufacturers who specialize in making methanol reactors or hydrogenation reactors um you know the the the, the supply and availability of those of those manufacturers is, is relatively limited and as a consequence the cost even per unit volume per unit weight is going to be a lot higher than if you just use uh, or you can just buy your own lathe and your own CNC machine. In fact, you can design, and I've done this, you can design the, the reactor vessel to be modular. So you'd have, you know, you take your, your vertical machining center and say, okay, well, the, the typical VMC, you know, machine is like 500 millimeters, right, of, 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 of axis, of travel axis. Um, so, you know, if you design your reactor vessel to be machinable in a relatively mid-sized CNC machine, you're going to further reduce the cost of your plant because then you can call up any supplier anywhere in the world. If, you, if, you, if you're nationalistic, you have to build it domestically, then you can do that uh, and just accept, you know, pay a higher price. Or, you know, if you're, if you're really aggressive, you can then look overseas because, granted, there's vast differences in GDP per capita and, and median wages. And, you know, it's not like we're greedy for taking advantage of that. Everyone wants a, a lower cost product and a more effective product and a more efficient product. And there's no point shooting yourself in the foot by limiting yourself to just local suppliers. You want to think big and you want to have a global outlook. All right, so we've now highlighted the, uh, the, the benefits of scaling the components down so that you can take advantage of relatively ubiquitous manufacturing technology, manufacturing processes, and the fact that these, these components we're, we're, we're desiring are dual use in the sense that the same factory that can produce um, the type of... Uh, of component that we're looking for, which is the only component that the only component we have to, to custom manufacture is actually the pressure vessel. So everything else is dual use, right? We don't need to go out and and, and, and re request custom manufacturing of, of anything but the pressure vessel, right? The compressor is already made, the PSA unit is already made, the electrolyzer we, we demonstrate we can easily make. Um, it's it's only the pressure vessel, okay? Put it in perspective, right? What we're doing is ultimately kind of you know, it might be offensive, but it's kind of a low IQ manufacturing 
uh, process. You know, we're forging shit and stamping shit and, and you know, using iron oxide. And, you know, there's guys building uh, stuff like, you know, Starlink satellites or, or SpaceX starships. I mean, these guys, you know, they look at this and think, you know, this is, this is for the guys who are, who are kind of a, a slightly dull. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't mean that this isn't an exciting industry with a lot of potential. But let's not exaggerate this. This is pretty low-tech stuff, okay? But, you know, imagine you're one of the big industry players, right? You're either an ammonia producer, so you produce a chemical, or you produce the components that go into the process, like Thyssen Krupp that makes the reactor vessels. You want people to think that this process cannot be done any other way, that, you know, you have to hire them because they have all the expertise, they have all the regulatory knowledge, they have all the certification knowledge, right? right? So the last thing they want you to know is that you can then go on Alibaba and search ammonia synthesis catalyst and actually buy it directly from the manufacturer for about $100 a kilogram. And I've already procured a quote. And, and if you buy more than two kilograms, it's about $100 per kilogram. And if you buy entire barrels full of it, it's probably only about $20 a kilogram because after all, it's just iron. Um, so... You know, they, they want you to think that this is a process that can only be done um, the way they do it. And, and they want you to buy the product, uh, the, the chemical and the, the, the machines and tools and systems needed to make the, the molecule from them. <clears throat> they don't want you to think this is something you can easily do yourself. And, you know, and, and you have to be very clear. When we're saying you can do this yourself, we're not saying this is like DIY. I mean, this is, this is a reasonably... Um, you know, moderate to low tech process. You need uh, kind of old school manufacturing technology, lathes, CNC machine, or CNC machines are not old school. Actually, you, only, you don't even need a CNC machine. You just have a manual lathe. Um, you need a lot of metal components, principally metal components. Nothing's really digital. I mean, people like to get all worked up about how, you know, we can have all these digital automated control systems and have like, you know, it's, it's all unnecessary because, you know, the ammonia industry got by by using um, manual systems for, in fact, any industry for that matter, right? It got by using mechanical manual systems and they worked just fine. And, you know, the, the cost really escalates when you start buying these really specialized components, you know, that are made by really exotic companies that... Um, you know, like if, imagine you bought a flow meter from Bosch, right? I mean, there's nothing. Bosch is a great company, but you know, it's just not what you want to do. What you want to do is look at how can I make this as simple as possible, as as cheaply as possible, um, while obviously still attaining the necessary safety factors to to make this this plant safe. And you know, there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, because, you know, obviously, no one's suggesting you skimp on materials. You obviously have to use materials that are resistant uh, resistant to the nitriding and the high temperature hydrogen but that's just a selection of alloys you know you don't you don't get any uh, anywhere by using a bunch of fancy components and automated digital systems you, you don't benefit from that what you, what you benefit from is making the the plant overbuilding the plant that's actually what you benefit from overbuilding the thickness of the wall of the main reactor vessel overbuilding the size of the valves overbuilding the size of the tubing that's how you achieve safety you don't achieve safety by dumping a bunch of money and a bunch of superfluous systems that look cool uh, and are very expensive, um, you, you, you actually achieve safety by building redundant systems, having two valves uh, or, or, or two um, redundant systems. So if one fails, you still have another to rely on. So and you do that by, by actually saving money and putting that extra money that you saved into redundant systems. Um, that's Joe Sutter's design philosophy. That Joe Sutter, the designer of the 747, he actually um, had four sets of hydraulic systems for the landing gear. So if I mean, three fail, you still had one to fall back on. Um, so, you know, that type of, uh, of design, design philosophy, we 100% adhere to. And no one's suggesting you skimp on, on quality because that's obviously a recipe for disaster because these are you know, reasonably high pressure systems, but you also don't want to go around saying that ammonia synthesis is the highest pressure process out there. It is, it's n by no means is it unique in its high pressure. And if anybody knows anything about the low density polyethylene business, they'll know that they operate it as, ho as high as 50,000 psi, and ammonia synthesis is you know, 5,000 at best. So, um, I mean, obviously, there's, there's many other sectors that, that use higher pressures than, than we're operating at. Um, 
Now, you know, the, the, the difference is that obviously ammonia is unique and it's operating at relatively high temperature in addition to operating high pressure. I mean, there's a lot of, of, of engineering sectors that might use ultra high pressures like, say, you know, um, water jet cutting. You know, that's 60,000 psi, but it's low temperature. Um, so I think this really summarizes, you know, where we're at as far as the technology. Um, the important points that we have to highlight are that we can absolutely scale down. We can accommodate the thermal uh, penalty that we encounter when we scale down the surface area or scale up the surface to volume ratio. Um, and we can also accommodate the unique compression challenges. We have to operate at part load. We have to ensure that we don't expose our catalyst to frequent uh, thermal fluctuation. We can do that with electric heaters. All sorts of innovative uh, solutions can be applied to make downscaling conventional Haber Bosch, not these exotic, unproven, largely ineffectual concepts that are being proposed for ammonia synthesis that will really never work. Okay? I mean, you cannot make ammonia at low pressure efficiently. It's just it's not done. You can try, and you can spend a lot of money on research trying to do that, but not a process that's amenable to plasma catalysis or low pressure. It's just simply not. Okay? Think about it, right? Ammonia is decomposed using high temperature and low pressure. Low pressure favors ammonia decomposition. Now, low temperature and high pressure favor synthesis. The problem is when you're at high um, pressure, when you're at low temperature and high pressure, the reaction is very slow. So if you operate the, if you increase the temperature, you speed up the reaction. But what, what, what else happens? Well, what happens is that you start decomposing some of the ammonia that you form, right? So if you lower your pressure, well, you're just going to decompose it all, right? Because the reaction is reversible. So you need to step up the pressure to prevent the decomposition.